All right, for the next little post here, I want to talk about some basics with MLA. And I'm just going to start by pulling this from basically MLA PowerPoint that I have used countless times. But I want to just sort of start going over this because now that we're into SA2, we're going to start dealing with the basic tenets of MLA more so than what we did with um, SA1. So let's go ahead and just take a look through this and just we're going to just start we're just going to start taking a look at this okay and so first of all let's talk about mla and what mla is now to start with what is mla mla stands for modern language association it's a style of formatting often used in various humanities disciplines english is one of them i've seen it used in um some history i've also seen apa used um, but it varies, so sometimes you'll encounter this. And later on, I will post some material about how to deal with a um, situation where maybe you have experience with MLA or APA, but you need to do it in a different format. I've got a citation style chart that I'm going to share with you um, by Friday that will help you uh, sort of navigate that. So what exactly does MLA do? Basically three things. Document formatting, in-text citations, and works cited lists. Now... We're going to talk about the, I'm not going to linger on what they changed for 8th edition, um, but let me go ahead and state here that whatever your instructor says, they have the ability to override the rules. Um, they can have, them, have you do it slightly different in variations, and whatever they ask you to do, that's what you should follow. I, in a minute here, you will see me do that exact same thing when I'm going to direct you to how I want you to do it. Now, typically, if you use my templates like I ask you to, the ones I provide for you, most of this basic document formatting stuff I take care of for you. So basically we're going to be a tight white 8.5 by 11 inch piece of paper. That's a standard piece of paper that's just not a legal document. We double space everything. We use 12 point Times New Roman or similar font. Here's the instructor note. I only want you to use Times New Roman 12 time point font. Okay, so there's me stepping in. We leave only one space after punctuation. We set our margins all at one inch. And we indent the first line of paragraphs, one half inch, which is just to say you hit tab. Okay. Most of that I take care of for you if you're using the templates. Now, I don't necessarily require that you use a header, but it does say here where a header would go. And there's a difference between a header and a heading. We'll see that in a second. Uh, we will use italics for most titles um, and place end notes on a separate page before the work cited which is you know, something, something you necessarily need to worry about. But let's talk about the first page. So with APA, you would have a title page. With MLA, we don't have one. And for the most part, I set most of this up for you if you're using my templates. But like I said, no title page. We double space everything. Now your heading goes in the left-hand corner where the, where the cursor is blinking when you open the document. And that's where you need to put your name, your instructor's name, the course, and the date. Now... If you notice any of the templates that I use, I tend to uh, put your ask for your name, the course, my name, and then the date. As long as it starts with your name and ends with the date, it really doesn't matter what you do with the two in between. I just happen to like that way. I would not hold it against you if you were to use it a different way. Again, as long as it begins with your name and ends with a date. Okay. We center the title of our papers. We don't use, we use standard cast. We don't underline or put italics or location marks, okay? You can create a header. I do not require it, but you can create a header. And that would require you to click on the double up there in the right-hand little box, where it's usually a blank space. If you double-click up there, you can insert a page number, and you can put your last name. And it should look something like this. So you'll see here... Here is the header, it's up in that white space, and that number will count based on the pages you use with your last name. Here's the name of the person, the instructor, the class, the date, title, here's the beginning of their paper. That's exactly how it does it. The only difference for you guys is we use subheadings. Now, the thing is, there are two ways to do subheadings in MLA. There's a numbered way and a bold way. I use the bold way if you've noticed anything so far from what I've been doing. And you will be able to notice this when you are looking at, um, or at least you should be noticing this if you look at the template for SA2. Don't worry about that. Now let's talk about parenthetical citations or in-text citations. Now, what are these? And basically what they are in brief um, is a text that indicates the source you consulted or that you have either summarized, paraphrased, or quoted from. 
It should direct readers to the works cited entry at the back of your paper. That's what it's there for. It should be unobtrusive. Okay, it's meant to provide us with a citation of information without interrupting the text, which is why we're going to keep it short. And in general, the in-text citation typically is an author's last name. If there is no author, you would use an abbreviated title with a page number, and you would enclose it in parentheses. Sometimes you won't even have page numbers. Sometimes it'll just be an author's last name, or it'll just be an abbreviated title. Let's consult this as our first example you'll see here that it has the idea that says words were stated that romantic poetry was marked by a quotations spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings close quotations in parentheses 263 now the next one is the same quotation romantic poetry is characterized by the quotation spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings wordsworth 263 what's the difference well if you look closely, the difference is that in the very first sentence, we use the author Wordsworth's name as part of the introduction to the quotation. Also notice that the quotation sort of seamlessly moves and feels like it belongs with the sentence. The only thing that makes it uh, so we know it's not part of the sentence is the quotation marks. So in the first example, we simply inserted the author's name. And I happen to like that one a lot because I think it makes it easier for you. And then we only put the page number in the citation. In the second example, we didn't use the author's name, and so therefore we needed to include it in the citation. Either is correct, but the idea being is that I should be able to take that Wordsworth 263, however I got it. I'm going to go to the Works Cited page, and I should find Wordsworth, comma, William. All right, that's why we put the last name first. Lyrical Ballads, Oxford UP, that's Oxford University Press, comma, 1967. If I were to go find that exact version of the book Lyrical Ballads by Wordsworth, the one that was in Oxford University Press, 1967. If I open up to page 263, I should be able to find that quote. It's about putting down a paper trail so that people know where you got this information and in case they want to follow it and check it for themselves or maybe they want to use that quotation, they can go and find it. Same thing goes and going on here for the sector of the circle um, again we have two examples one where we use the author kenneth burke's name in before as an introduction to the quote and then when we didn't and we put his last name in the quote either way it should find us back to this right here burke comma kenneth language of symbolic actions essay on life literature and the method u of california p which is university of california press 1966 so if again I wanted to find, I went and found that book by that author from that year and that publisher and open to page three, I should ideally find that quote. So like I said, it's just a paper trail of making sure people know where you got your information so that they can take you seriously and credible. Now here's an example where we don't have an author. So we'll see here. We see so many global warming hotspots in North America, likely because this region has quote, more readily accessible climatic data and more comprehensive programs to monitor the study of environmental change, close quote. Now you'll see here that this time we didn't have an author, so we've just moved over to the next thing. And typically after an author is the title. So in this case, this was an article, probably online. That's usually where you encounter these. And you'll see impact of global warming. And we kept it in quotation marks because that's going to be something that's going to be there in the work cited entry as well because that's how you indicate that something is an article. All right, and here is the citation, the full citation. Now you'll notice we actually shortened it because if you look right here, impact of global warming, the full title is actually the impact of global warming in North America. Now in this case, what we were able to do is to try and be as unobtrusive as possible, we ended up shortening it a little bit. Not so much that we wouldn't be able to find it in the works cited page, but we trimmed it. We trimmed a prepositional phrase in North America. Okay, that's the title. That was found on Global Warming Early Signs in Italic there. That's a website, 1999. Ideally, you should probably have a URL there for if we were doing this in proper MLA. And then we do have a date of access, all right? Um, now, this one I'm not going to worry about here, the top one, but the authors with the same last name. If you happen to be in a situation where you have authors with the same last name and you're citing them, we simply include the first initial to make a distinction. So this might be Ron Miller and Ann Miller. And to make sure that you are finding the correct works cited entry, you would just simply include the first initial to help us make that distinction. 
Um, now, here's another thing with multiple authors. With MLA these days, once you go to three or more authors, you change things up. And I want to focus in on this very this second one right here. The first one does also connect to this. It says, the authors state, tighter gun control in the United States erodes Second Amendment rights. Smith, E.T., A.L., period, 76. Now, that is a situation where there was three or more potential authors to show us and so that we can list it alphabetically in our works cited page whoever the lead or the first author listed we put their last name so there's obviously a somebody smith who is the lead author and then there might have been strong ellis or whoever other there could have been any number of them but to keep us from being unobtrusive once we got to that point we would simply put smith et space al period that's standing in for all those other authors and then of course if we have anything shorter than that say two authors we simply put their last names this is what you would do when you regards to your comic book art a writer artist okay now here's an example where i have more than one source or one piece of a uh, one source of information but we have the same author we just simply, to avoid confusion, for example, I've had the situation happen to me, if you remember Kenneth Burke earlier, they had language of symbolic actions. Well, in my both my thesis and my dissertation, I think I was quoting um, him multiple times uh, from multiple sources. And so what I would end up having to do, rather than put Burke's last name, I would have to put the rhetoric of motives or the grammar of motives or language of symbolic action. Because I had to put that, and I would usually do what they did here, where I had Leitner, I would put Burke. So Leitner has argued that computers are not useful tool for small children. That's an abbreviated title of an article and page number. Though he has acknowledged elsewhere that early exposure to computer games is a letter uh, does lead to better small motor skills, development of child second uh, and third year hand-eye development. So this is an example where we have two sources by Leitner. And to make sure that we make it very clear who and what source we are specifically referencing, we have inserted the abbreviated titles in the place. And so for my example with Kenneth Burke, I had rhetoric of motives, grammar of motives, language of symbolic action. I had those titles in there, and I usually use the author's name as part of the um, introduction to the quotation or something. Now, um, I'm not going to worry about the quintillion here, but let's talk about citing the Bible real quick, okay? Because this is just an interesting one. I always find it fascinating to talk with students about this. Now, what we're about to say here is nothing that I'm about to say to you has anything to do with secular versus religious, okay? So let's look at the quote here. Ezekiel saw, quotations, what seemed to be four living creatures, goes quotations, each with the faces of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. Now, look what's inside the, the, the citation. New Jerusalem Bible, comma, Ezekiel 1, colon, 5, dash 10. Of course, I abbreviated Ezekiel, okay? 1, colon, 5, dash 10 is chapter and verse. But why did I not put God, okay? And again, this is not a secular or religious thing. What it is, is that the Bible was originally written, and some of it in Aramaic, most of it in Greek, and over the 2,000 plus years it's been around, it has been translated into many, 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 many variations. So that sometimes has an impact on the words. For example here, this is why we're telling you we're using the New Jerusalem Bible, because we want to make sure that you read this and understand that we are quoting from that Bible, that translation. For example, 2 Corinthians has the line, um, at the you know the three most important things are faith, hope, and love. All right, and then and the most important of these is love. Well, that's the New Revised Standard Version. If I was reading that in the New King James Version, it would actually read faith, hope, and charity. So you see, words can be different different depending on translation. So that's why we have to put that. Um, all right, just real quickly, this one here at the top, citing indirect sources. This is an example that I don't expect any of you to encounter, but I have encountered it. Um, you're looking for a, a quotation, and you find the quotation, but it's being quoted by somebody else, and you can't quite find a copy of the original. So rather than throw it out, what you do here 
is look at how it starts. Radovich argues that high school is pressure. Uh, ha, are, high schools are pressured to act as quote social service centers, and they don't do that well. Close quote. Now that's Radovich, and that's what he said. But rather than the fact that in this case we don't have the original source, rather what we did was we QTD period in Weissman two fifty nine. That's another way of saying we are quoting it. We, we are pulling it as it was quoted in Weissman, which in this case is another author's book, 259. I don't anticipate that one you to come across, but just to let you know. Now, this one I don't agree with. Um, for example, this is somebody citing uh, the, uh, a, a line or scene from Buffy the TV show. And if you'll see here, for example, Buffy and they have a timestamp. I don't believe in doing this to anybody. And I also don't like the way that they cite this at all. I would actually say the more correct way to actually cite this would have been to put Hush, not Buffy. Okay. And then uh, that would have been enough for an in-text citation. And then you could have come down here and you would have found the real, the full thing. And if you want to go find the exact moment that it happens, that's entirely up to you. Just saying. Um, if you have an example where there is no page number, we just put the author's last name. Okay. And then real briefly, I want to talk about short quotations, long quotations, ellipses, and brackets. Now, when we are citing something in short quotation, what this means is it is something that is, when we're quoting something, it doesn't go over maybe three lines of text. And what you're looking at here are three ways that are all correct to properly cite one okay here's one where the quotation is in the middle of the sentence and you can put the citation there you could also put it at the end here's an example of somebody citing it where they use the introduction of the author's name and here's one where they actually quote at the end and they put the author's name and the page number all those are correct but the main reason we cite and we use quotation marks in short quotations is because the way we integrate them with what we are talking about so we need to make very clear that we indicate which part of this is our words and which part of this is somebody else's words this gets different when we deal with a long quote here is an example of a long quote now technically this should be tabbed over a little bit it would be indented but you notice here that it is separated it is sitting by itself and as a result of that we get to change the rules first of all we don't have quotation marks and whereas with these here where we make sure that we put the citation before the punctuation okay that's important that you put the citation before the punctuation we'll talk about that some more but in a block quote, because it's going to be sitting by itself, I don't need the quotation marks and I don't have to put the punctuation after the citation because this citation can belong to nothing else but this because literally when I start typing my words again, I'm going to start on a new line. Okay. Here's how we're doing it with poetry. Um, and then here's how we use ellipses and brackets. Now, brackets are something we can use inside a quotation that allows us to add words if we need to clarify something. So let's look at this example. Jan Harold Brunavan, in an essay on urban legends, states, quote, some individuals, in brackets, who retell urban legends, close brackets, make a point of learning every rumor or tale. Now, that quote originally said, some individuals make a point of learning every rumor or tale. That can seem a little vague. So what we did in the brackets here was to clarify who those some individuals were. So you'll see there's some individuals in the brackets who retell urban legends. That's us inserting our own words into the text in order to help clarify something, something you can do. The other thing you can do is you can use ellipses, or as you'll see here, the dot, 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 to skip ahead and omit parts of a original text that you don't need. So look at this. In an essay on urban legends, Jan Hoover Vance notes that, quote, some individuals make a point of learning every rumor or tale, dot, 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 and in a short time, a lively exchange of details occurs. Now, it still makes sense, but what it's trying to tell you by the ellipses is that there was something inside there, word, two words, three words, four words, whole sentences, that we didn't want or need, and so therefore we have cut it. That's what it's there to show us, okay? Now, we'll talk about this next part in our next PowerPoint, but that's where I'm going to uh, stop us for now.